Welcome to Reflections on Music and Nature. This is episode two of season two. I'm very pleased to present here my interview with Peter London, a visual artist, teacher, and art therapist based in Davis, California. He is Chancellor Professor Emeritus at University of Massachusetts Dartmouth and has held numerous teaching positions and given lectures at institutions throughout North and South America, Europe, Japan, and Israel. His paintings have been exhibited nationally and internationally in venues throughout the United States and his work is included in many public and private collections. He has also published numerous books and academic articles on art making and the creative process. He and his wife currently split their time between Davis, California and Shelburne, Massachusetts. I met Peter several years ago in Davis where I had the pleasure of working with him on a composition inspired by some of his artworks. He's a deep thinker about art and nature and someone who is constantly searching for some very hard to reach places such as how to escape the limitations of human thought and instead look to nature as a model for living and creating. After we moved to Massachusetts, he invited my partner and I to visit him and his studio in Western Mass, which is where we recorded our conversation. First, let's listen to a recording of our collaboration together, featuring Kurt Rohde on viola, who was a guest in the last episode of this series. I hope you enjoy. Peter, thank you so much for taking the time to do this. It's really great to see you and look at your studio here with all of your work. Um, I'd like to start by talking about your own personal relationship with the natural world, whatever that means to you, which I know you've written a lot about it. Um, in, throughout your lifetime and in your kind of work from when you were very young to, to now, like what could you describe your own relationship with the natural world? When you ask that question, immediately what comes to mind is um, our family lived in Brooklyn and we used to uh, summer out in either Long Island or up in the mountains at Catskills. And the place that we stayed at had a great big lake nearby. And while my family, uncles and aunts and everybody else, were eating and smoking and <clears throat> playing cards, I would wander off around past where the people were swimming, where there were uh, just some trees and rocks and so on. And I spent the time looking under rocks for uh, all kinds of little insects and uh, wire worms and um, things like that. And then I would bring these treasures back to where everybody was eating and smoking and playing cards. And I must say, my parents, especially around my mom, said, oh, wonderful, Peter but now you have to bring it back. But so while civilization was bubbling all around me, uh, I was not very interested in playing cards or smoking or, mm. and especially eating. I was interested in just uh, looking under stones. And I think that same curiosity and that same sense of adventure and the beauty of hidden things revealed, that's very much continues to be an element of my work. Well, uh, you're right. In your writings, as I mentioned, you talk about this a lot, um, about the way that us, you know, as a culture have increasingly become disconnected from nature and how through you know, art making and making art, we can kind of rekindle our relationship mm. with the natural world. So um, maybe if you could talk about how do you how do you think it is that we become so disconnected from nature and how is it that 
art yes. and your work can can, he pull it can down? help you know rekindle that connection. I should say maybe it, there's a, a link uh, here. I became very interested as a young kid in uh, Indigenous Americans, and uh, I thought of myself as a young kid as really adopted by my parents, my white Caucasian Jewish parents, yeah. uh, but that I was really an Indian that <laughs> somehow uh, uh, they got. And so I was very interested in uh, getting uh, moccasins that had little beads with that. My, my, one of my uncles, two of my uncles were in the millinery business, so it was a feather factory. And I remember getting feathers and making headdresses for myself and so on. And then the other thing was my mom or maybe one of my aunts, it was my mother, got me um, Alfred Lawn Tennyson's uh, Hiawatha, the Song of Hiawatha. And it, it was an enchanted world, <clears throat> that very, very different from my apartment in Brooklyn. So my fantasy life, I think, my imaginative life, my kind of soulful self, was not a kid growing up in Brooklyn, but somehow transposed to this other natural thing, <clears throat> natural world, birch bark canoes and bows and arrows and cooking things, potatoes on a fire or something like that. So my my sense of civilization, I'm not very fond of civilization and what uh, a lot of it, uh, but I now in later years, so that was that indigenous year, the song of Hiawatha and, and, and that, very important to me. And I drew a lot of those uh, pictures too. Later on, I became acquainted with um, uh, Buddhism. And I found another, but a different kind of affinity with uh, the natural world <clears throat> as, as the thing that is uh, 14 billion years old, knows how to do everything that is in the world, doesn't lie, doesn't cheat. Uh, and is unabashedly itself. I love those things. No lying, no cheating, unabashedly, everything that it is is. And it's for everybody, for anything. No ticket of admission, no prerequisites. So that's sort of my early life and that sort of transposition to something perhaps maybe even less sophisticated than my early life. But so that continuity uh, of the natural world and my affinity with it. Insofar as my work, very, very briefly, at some point, and I wrote about this in one of my books, <clears throat> that I had this, uh, this moment of uh, crisis that, in my work, and I guess my personal life, that I didn't want to make things the way I was taught to make things by other people <clears throat> who were coming from a certain tradition. I wanted to see if I could make things like the cosmos makes things mm -hmm. by wearing and precipitating and rubbing and scrubbing and marking and clawing and so on and erupting and smoothing and suffocating and so on. And to see if I, if I worked like the cosmos worked, what would that cosmos working through me, a particular formation of, mm. uh, of the cosmos, what would that look like? So a lot of my work is, <laughs> that's what I am, a kind of a transistor between this world <clears throat> of, the, of the great world and this particular human form of it and how it, it is uh, expressed. So maybe there's like, I mean, you grew up in Brooklyn, which is, you know, city, very city, right? And you always desire to be in nature in a way, which was sort of the opposite of your upbringing. Maybe it's something uh, like a certain baggage of, of civilization, too, that you're hoping to kind of get away from in your artwork, maybe? Like, instead of trying to do things as people are telling you, trying to just 
to listen to what is there and let things sort of be themselves and draw closer to the self, which is something you also mm. have written about. There's a nice little statement, I think, <clears throat> in the, the, the Tao, uh, uh, not the Tao of physics, but the Lao Tzu's uh, Tao. He says, do you think uh, you can improve upon the world? And the next sentence says, I don't think so. I like the idea of, can I be uh, fully uh, mindful preacher and not try to improve upon the world, make it any prettier or better uh, in some kind of way, but be as natural as the world is natural. And if I can do that as an artist, hopefully, the, the process and the effort to draw closer to nature that way in my art will somehow imbue that same quality in, in my life. There's an element to your the previous question, will that save the world? Mm -hmm. by, by, uh, not by my work, but I do think if, if there is a, um, a return to the way the whole cosmos works, the more likelihood that this particular speciation mm -hmm. of the cosmos might endure a little longer than it seems to be headed for currently. Sure. Um, could you talk about how nature influences your artistic process, like when you're working in the studio in, in any way, from either as a way of helping you get ideas or kind of in the way that you think about the like process itself in art? Uh, I think so. <laughs> I'll try so. Um, I, I don't think nature fools around. And I, when I work, I don't, I don't like to fool around. I don't like to embellish, that's what I mean by fooling around. I think nature is, uh, is humorless. It's extraordinary. So I don't like to kid around. I don't like to be fool around. I don't like to be half-assed. Whatever nature does, it's a, it's, it can't help but being 100%. It doesn't have 99%. It only has 100%. I like to be 100%. Um, I don't, uh, I don't, I try to, nature doesn't seem to decorate anything. It is just what it is. And if it has, and, and because it's up against survival itself, and it has to uh, live and thrive and throb <clears throat> in the world that, it doesn't take any prisoners. I, I like my art not to take any prisoners in that kind of way. Um, so I, I interpret how the world works biologically <clears throat> in physics and chemistry. And, and I guess because I'm human, bring it into kind of an ethical consideration in terms of how I make the things that I, that I make. So in that way, there is that kind of uh, physical sensibility into a moral sensibility or ethical into an aesthetic one that hopefully has a, an alignment with all, all three. Do you see making art as a kind of activism in a way, or or do you feel that like your work as an artist is separate or not necessarily related to that? When I grew up in New York, my wife and I were very, very engaged in political affairs, <clears throat> in uh, uh, in uh, issues of uh, race. We, we we marched on Washington. We were actually there in the Martin Luther King. Uh, talk. We were in Washington again lots of times with Ban the Bomb in Vietnam and then the war and angry arts and everything like that. And we're very politically aware then and active uh, in our community as well, running for school board and such. 
I found that um, at the time, it seemed like I was giving the very best of what I had to the very most important things of the world. I haven't noticed an iota of difference in the world mm -hmm. <laughs> with giving it everything that I had. And, um, and I, rue, I rue that. I'm not pleased that I've stepped away from kind of the front lines of political engagement with my art um, because I still believe that, that the arts are also on the bulwark of the of civilization. But I have found that if if I'm of two minds, if when I'm what I was just saying before about not kidding around and being serious, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera, and I'm also thinking of Trump and Biden. Uh, and I'm thinking about the uh, Proposition 203 or something like that. Then this becomes one more political adventure. I'm not good at the political adventure. <clears throat> um, I've, I've, I've poured whatever I had into it for decades, mm -hmm. decades, and heard nothing in response. It's like talking, talking, nobody there. Now, maybe there was somebody there, but not, but not that I know of. At least here, I have, when I make a mug, it's there. And, um, and it's unequivocally there, and, and it's, uh, it's autobiographically there. Does it change the world very much? It changes that tiny little section <laughs> that I just drew upon. It's like being a, a, a teacher. There were lots of opportunities to advance from a faculty member to a chair, to a dean, to so on. And I found that my most a uh, significant effort had its palpable result in the classroom of working with that that student, that group for that time, I could see something palpable in the world happen. I need that as a mortal. I want with to your, see something students, possible. You know, yeah, yes, yeah. that's right. And I still have, of course, that that, that that harvest continues to come over the many years from the people. So I know my arena in the world is small, my students, and my arena in terms of social activism, of enhancing uh, uh, the quality of life for others, is in a relatively small uh, space as well. And isn't it? Well, you've taught in many different types of context, you know, for people who are, you know, kind of in the university setting to people who are just starting art. And you, you also worked as an art therapist, I understand too. So I'm really, really curious of, about how these different, like, what have you learned from these different experiences as an artist, as a teacher, as a therapist? Like, how have, the, how have all of those different activities kind of mm. informed each other and intersected with each other? That's a tall story. <laughs> um, I began uh, uh, teaching all wrong. <clears throat> I started uh, teaching in uh, the Bensonhurst area of uh, Brooklyn purposefully uh, because, again, of my engagement with the uh, civil rights of the, at that period of time. And I thought I had, I uh, now realize I had a kind of a missionary point of view. Yeah. I was uh, going to bring great art to the downtrodden who had never mm -hmm. known it. So I was going to bring the high renaissance to these kids in Brooklyn who uh, mostly either didn't uh, uh, live at, in, a, in a home base or didn't have a home or lived on the street. And so I was going to enrich their life with this way. They were not interested in it. They were not <laughs> yeah. interested in a white guy. Uh, and they were interested. They were not interested in the teacher. They were not interested in art. They were not interested in school. And they were not interested in the high Renaissance when they're scrapping every day just to get by. So that didn't work. So I had to disassemble everything that I thought that art could do for people, and um, and did something very different. 
uh, I had to start from zero, my zero, but I, but what I started was, was with, oh, you're not interested in me and what I have to say and Columbia University and all things like that. So oh, what are you interested in? Well, of course, they were interested in themselves. And so I became interested in themselves. Yeah, well, that's a novel way to, uh, um, to teach, to not to have something that I was feeding them, but that I was going to listen to them and see what they were eating anyway. Well, that, that linked very nicely eventually with um, art therapy, which doesn't have an agenda like a teacher does of the curriculum, but has a question, how are you doing? Yeah. Well, there's a lot of that. <laughs> Everybody's talking about how you do. And then so becoming an instrument for their becoming was important. My wife at that time uh, had a training as a clinical psychologist. And in listening to her and talking to her friends about what they were doing, who were also clinicians, they, they were talking about what makes a person become the person that they are. And there was a question that I, was never taught to me as something that I should be interested in as a sure. teacher. What, what, what? As an art teacher, yeah. That's right. And as an artist. Or as a teacher. Oh, yeah. That's right. And so I became interested in that. And then also uh, in terms of psychodynamics and that how a person presents themselves is not necessarily the person that they are keeping in abeyance, which is more precious than they're willing to show to anybody. Mm -hmm. So how can I listen to and watch for the signs of what they are hiding and not merely what they are saying? And how this and this is really almost the opposite of that. So that's... So I, had, I learned that kind of thing through art therapy, and then I became, I think, a more effective uh, uh, facilitator of the person's becoming than, uh, than I was as a ill-prepared teacher to simply feed the person that I thought I had a lot of stuff to, to feed. Well, there's another thing about that now. So all of that, I think, is one thing. Another thing is just what is there about the artistic experience that is itself is in itself uh, healing. I think that at every at every level of one's development, there is more to be said than what you have said. And that art forms, music as well as the visual arts, but all art forms, is, presents another language with which to finally get to say what has been unable to be said before. And that you can't use the conventional language, verbal language, because it's, it's, it's spoiled for you for some reason. Uh, how people listen to you, how they interpret it, how you use it, it's all, it's all other people's stuff. But if you could finally find a language system which is a natural one for you, then there are things that you can utter and express about how life has been for you that a borrowed language can't offer you. And I think all the art forms offer for those particular people who have the propensity in that direction a way to say how it is that other ways don't say. There's lots more to that, but that's the core of what I think how art as an expressive medium, or the arts as an expressive medium, serve to complete a person who otherwise feels ununderstood, misunderstood, or etc. So do you feel that maybe your work in therapy and like your experience with you know psychology has helped you become a more empathetic teacher or someone to like, yeah, I'm, I'm very interested in like how that has affected the way that you try and teach. Utterly, yeah. it's completely, 
Um, when I was earlier, I was saying when I began to teach um, in, the, in this is a high school, <clears throat> Thomas Jefferson High School in New York. So I found that everything that I knew how to do and everything that I knew and cherished was completely antithetical. Yeah. And irrit it was an irritant yeah. <clears throat> uh, to everybody. So I so then I had nothing, right? Oh my God. Now what? Square one. Like That's right. Yeah, yeah. Now I'm here in front of the... And at that time, um, I was uh, uh, a non-public uh, speaker at all. Mm -hmm. So I had these 30 kids in front of me, hated me, hated yeah, me, me sure. in every possible legitimate way. And I'm supposed to say something. You thought you had some knowledge, and now the knowledge doesn't help anymore. <laughs> That's right. Uh, 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 yeah. So then, uh, So that didn't work. So, as I say, then completely turning around me instead of as a professor but me as an inquisitor mm -hmm. and as a helpmate and as a facilitator and as close dancing but not too close and not too far away offered, offered an, uh, uh, a thoughtful and uh, an available and rich literature that I could then uh, uh, enter. I think it, it made it made an enormous difference. Uh, I wasn't the same person as a teacher when I walked into a classroom. It was me, but the old me was simply. Is it a matter of like learning more, like kind of crafting your lessons more around the group of people that you have in front of you? Is that what it is, or is it about lis listening to what's in the room? Or I'm curious about how how it changed. Did you have to learn a way. totally new subject in art, or? Well, 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 it's actually, everything changed. Yeah. So when I started class, <clears throat> um, it's a little different when I'm uh, teaching a formal class, that's a required class, at a university for people who need certification or something, and you do have to cover some material. So I, I have to bring in some of that because in fact, they do need to know some stuff, and they need to know it even for an exam. But the way I start every time that I teach is I ask, what brings you here? And uh, that's really about the first question. And how they say it, and how they interact with one another, and how the stories of each one begin to form a certain kind of architectural coherent something, uh, then I can begin to assemble uh, a process by which I can, I can legitimize, that is the first thing that I'll do after they say why I'm here and what I'm concerned about and so on. Then I sort of know the sen somewhat of the sensitivity points and some of the peaks that they're going to, and some of the, the directions and, the, and the, um, uh, the pace that they're going. So then I'll do, and the next thing that I'll do is something that Everybody can do, everybody loves to do, and it's non-invidious, uh, uh, so, such a thing. So then everybody finally had the opportunity to say, here's where I'm here, and now I did something, and that nobody ran away from me, nobody snickered, nobody was embarrassed, nobody threw up, and, they, and everybody was there. So then, then I had that kind of basis. Then I can see how they react to success rather than the mm -hmm. Then I can see from that success, well, I can now move here, but then I know it's this kid over there. So I play, I play the, the possibilities and the potentiality and the dynamics, the movement, the momentum of the group itself, and I keep moving it along in that uh, direction. Great. Uh, shifting gears a bit into your interest in music. So we had the opportunity to work together on a project where you know I was able to respond musically to one of your artworks, and here we're sitting amongst your own artwork here. Um, I know you've done similar projects like this, I believe with other people, right? Mm -hmm. Other musicians and composers. I'm very curious about like what has, I mean, I, I know you're also an avid music fan as well. So what, like what inspires you to kind of seek out these collaborations across discipline in the first place? With musicians. Yeah. Because Specifically I, music. Yeah. yeah, right. Well, particularly and only music actually. Mm -hmm. Well, somewhat dance. <clears throat> because I've also done something, actually, with the choreographers. 
But I think of music has the all of the um, principles that I'm working with spatially, temporally, tone, value, pace, interval, rhythm, contrast, texture, etc., etc. Uh, I I have a, a light form of synesthesia in that when I listen to music, I don't so much see, but I experience the architecture of the piece. I don't actually see a building, blah, 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 but somehow I feel its structure. So, um, so I have that kind of affinity, uh, intellectually or neurologically. But also, of all of the art forms, music brings me to tears and emotional uh, uh, heightened sensibility more than any other art form. I'm, 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 I'm attacked by, by music deeply. And so, so formally as, an, uh, as a craftsman who makes things, I'm that way, but then emotionally, I'm simply subject to the phenomena of music. And when I look at my work as a kind of critic of my work, sometimes as I'm working itself, I'm working, I think, in a kind of a, a musical sensibility. But as I look at it, I look at it is 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 it is it a beautiful sound? Great. Um, so, I would also be interested to hear. Like, I know the search for the soul is part of a is like an interest of yours. Like this idea of what the soul is, and I know that your your official answer to that is that I don't know what the soul is. <laughs> um, but I'm curious about how this quest or this search for what a soul is, how does that, why is that important to you, and how does that help you as an artist? Uh oh, you see that? It's, it's, it's the poltergeist upstairs. <laughs> it? It's just a wind blowing the. Uh, okay. Okay. No, I'm just like, okay. Uh, so, so. Should I check could, it? I don't think so, because I can see the wind is picked up a little bit. Oh, okay. Well, I don't think the word soul and how it's used and so on is is how <coughs> i'm feeling about it mm -hmm. but what can you do you have to use some handle onto onto that everything is is inexplicably <laughs> mysterious to me anyway i don't really understand anything but what i don't understand especially is how uh little energy packets, little electrons and quarks and basons and bosons and mesons with charm and sometimes not charm can somehow come together in such a way as to not only be life, but to be thought. The gap between the mechanical world way up to Biolo biological, not just simply physics and chemistry, but biology and, and organic uh, stuff. But to thought is such a huge one that that's some, some other phenomena must uh, enter into that arrangement to make it quick. It's that other thing, or a phenomenon, not a thing, but that other phenomena that makes um, uh, things uh, lively, sensible, aware, responsive, grieving, hoping, desiring, etc. That that's hard for me to imagine 
that it's just the architecture of things that bring all of that extraordinary phenomenology about. So whatever that, how that is introduced into this um, beaker, that's the soul. Um, and finally, how is it that you think drawing closer to nature helps us draw closer to ourselves? Aha. Mm. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, because um, the self that we have mostly taken ourselves to be in our particular civilization is an artifact of civilization itself and of the stories and of the customs and the ways of this particular species. But we're just one species of trillions, apparently, even on this one little planet, of, of intelligences. And, and, we, and we capture and we behave and we think of ourselves and others in smaller ways and distorted ways when everything that we are looking at ourselves with is only what we have been looking at ourselves with. And that great nature is much larger than that, much more complex than that, much more exquisite than that. And if, and so, so by attending to this larger and, and, and available, you know, to get a ticket to do it by attending to the world and that that it is and therefore in some way we are more exquisite more complex more interpenetrated more of everything than we have taken ourselves to be and therefore the civilizations that we have constructed thinking of ourselves so smallly and so poorly have been themselves small and small and poor, and and grading it. That we our warfare is is because we're wrong, mm -hmm. <laughs> and that wrongness is like a poorly made engine. It's grinding itself to pieces, and it's grinding every goddamn thing that it comes in contact with too. Um, there's there's a great deal more to the world and therefore there's a great deal more to being and if we study more fully more comprehensively the ways of the world I think we will uh, we will expand our own definition of what it is to be human which is a larger, uh, more compatible uh, phenomena in the world than we have uh, taken uh, ourselves and our civilization and our world to be. Is there anything else you'd like to add that I haven't asked you about? I'm pretty happy with this. You did a great job. Well, thanks. Really, thank you. Thanks so much. Good, wonderfully informed and thoughtful questions. Thank so you so much for the time. Yeah.